Sorry you didn't get a break. Uh, I am it before lunch, though, so hopefully you can manage to stay with me for the next 45 minutes before lunch. Uh, this presentation is Give Your Build Some Love. It will give it back. I'm Amanda Martin, developer advocate for Gradle Build Tool. Um, and first off, I don't know many of you here. How many of you are software developers, actual developers? Okay, awesome. How many of you are build tool engineers? Really? Wow, okay. That's, that's a lot more than I thought. Um, so this is geared towards software developers. Uh, for those build tool engineers in here, just, uh, sorry, it's probably way, way too easy for you, but it's for the software developers. So a little bit about me. I have been at Gradle for uh, five months, not very long. I absolutely love it there because it's an open source, it's an open source community. And I love interacting with software developers on how to improve their build because software developers shouldn't spend too much time as a build engineer. I think that they're very different. You should know a little bit, but you don't have to get into the weeds. So this presentation is available on tiny URL. So if you go to that link, you'll see the entire presentation. You can save it, you can do whatever you want with it in the open source manner. It is yours to have and keep and whatever else. I like to go to that presentation during the presentation, copy it and take notes in the speaker notes. That's kind of my thing. And then you can go to your work and pretend like you were an expert in build tool engineering, okay? So the agenda for today is we're gonna go over what is Gradle, the structure of builds, and then we're gonna get into some details that I think are really useful for that software engineer. And that's the Java versions, uh, testing a little bit, dependencies, which you guys have heard a lot about already, and then the big one is performance. What can you do to your build to make it perform better? So first, the evolution of things. In general, when something comes to be, you start with the basics, the core features, and then as the evolution, as the thing evolves, we get an evolution where we start to add performance features. We start to add safety, security, as we saw with the last two presentations, and of course, assistive features. Now, this is true for almost everything that we look at that has evolved. Uh, Therese did a good example of cars, so I'll duplicate that here and also use a car example. The very first car, it could essentially just accelerate and turn and a little bit of brakes, right? But over time, cars have evolved. We have more safety, we have more assistive features, we have airbags and self-parking. So cars have evolved to have all these new things to it. Well, build systems are very much the same. They started out as just something to compile your code, and then we added testing, packaging. Now, however, the build tool system can do so much more. We know that the build tool can do Uber jars, it can do a whole bunch of group tests. There are so many things that the build tool can do that oftentimes people say that it can do too much so, that, so they don't even bother starting to use a build tool because it's so complicated and hard to kind of learn the nitty gritty details. My job here is to help you into that though, so don't be scared. So as you use the build tool, we know it can compile, test, and package code but over time, it's able to give the user a little bit more feedback. For example, if you use the build tool, you can get some analysis on how much test coverage you can have. If you use the right plugin, you can do some code styles, so you don't have to worry about all those pecky tabs and everything else. You could also generate your palms if you want to export it somewhere else. So there's a lot of feedback that we get from the build tool that makes it so that it does a lot more than test, compile, and package. It's now a really useful part so that you can take your programming further. So a little bit about me. I have been doing coding in some regards since about 2005. It's been a long time. Most of my code, this is how I compiled it. I have scripts upon scripts upon scripts that just compile the code. If I wanted to upgrade something, well, oftentimes I would take somebody's code and put it in my package. Copy, paste into my package. Sorry, Therese, I know that's bad. <laughs> and then I would just run it and compile it like normal. And that was good for small projects. It worked. 
But as we've gotten bigger and bigger projects, this isn't efficient for so many reasons. And there's also none of those assistive features in this manner. Now, Gradle comes up a lot. This was a tweet that just happened the other day that I really liked because, you know, how do you describe what Gradle is or what a build tool is? In this one, they say, this led me to explain Gradle to a family member. Gradle is a little program that allows you to easily reuse code written by other programmers and other stuff. And that's true. That's what Gradle lets you do. If you see some other code, you can easily take it into yours. Make sure you can trust it, though, because otherwise you might have security vulnerabilities, and we spent time learning about that. So Gradle is a little bit more than that now, though. Gradle has this completely extensible configuration model. We have an entire dependency resolution engine. And of course, like you expect from a build tool, we execute tasks. It's kind of the core feature right there, right? OK. So we've been around since 2008. So my coding is older than Gradle itself. I feel a little bit good about that because I didn't use it until about five months ago. Hmm, that lines up, huh? Um, so we've been around for a long time. We are one of the top open source platforms, um, one of the 20 most popular according to TechCrunch, and we get 30 million monthly downloads. So we've, we're there, we've been there for a while, and we're well used. You see us in Java, which is why we're here, in Groovy, of course, in Scala, and then a whole bunch of other places. Uh, we also are in Kotlin. I heard some people talking about Kotlin in the, the hallway track, which is pretty cool because we really like Kotlin. We also have Gradle Enterprise, which is essentially what funds us as an open source community. Uh, and this is what Justin gave his talk about, which is all about developer productivity engineering. And by the way, DevProd Engineering is a great concept. They have a good book, but also they have a conference in November. So if you like conferences, then this is a really good one where you get to hear from Netflix and Meta and all those places. The other thing that the Gradle Enterprise does, and this is what I love, is it does build scans. Build scans are a free tool where you can go into your build and you can start to see you know, which classes take longest, you can start to see code coverage and everything else in your build scan. And this is completely free because it's essentially one of the ways that people go in to buy the enterprise product. So I love build scans. And of course, we're hiring. Lots of job openings. So those software engineers and the build engineers that raise your hand, we're hiring a lot of people. OK, so how do you use it? Most of us probably use it via the Gradle wrapper. Now, the Gradle wrapper is anytime you're in the command line and you type in dot forward slash Gradle W and then whatever task you want to run. The great thing about Gradle Wrapper is the person that you're sending your project to doesn't need Gradle installed on their computer to use the Gradle Wrapper. It's all built in. They need Java, but they don't need Gradle. So if you're trying to package up your project and send it to another software engineer, you don't want that software engineer to worry about the build at all. So they use the Gradle Wrapper. Now, this pains me so much, because my first operating system was TWM. Anyone use TWM? Tom's Window Manager? No? I have someone smiling back there. They've at least heard of Tom's Window Manager. So everything was command line back when I started in 2005 because I was hard, hardcore Linux. So this pains me, but a lot of people don't use the command line apparently anymore. I don't know. So you can also use Gradle from the IDE. I prefer IntelliJ. Some people like to use VS Code. Uh, we do both. And then, of course, you could also do it with other various command line usage. So notice in here that I have docs. Um, this is the only slide I have docs listed as docs. After this, it's just links. But one of the reasons is because then you could click on it and see how things run and whatnot. OK. So like I said, Gradle is an expandable configuration. So when you look at the docs, this is probably a little backwards from what you're used to. Here is using the base plugin, Java. And whenever you're doing a task, in this case, in the bottom right, is the assemble task. That relies on other things. And so the assemble, it takes all of the jars below it and the source jars, and so that it could assemble them together. In this case, 
that jar is composed of classes, and then below that is compiled Java. So Gradle knows to go in, and if you're doing the assemble task, it essentially builds everything up from what is needed. Now, as we go through, you'll see that there's a lot of people that contribute to Gradle, and we have a very extensive plug-in system. And I'll get into that, what it means in a minute. And part of that is because we have a dynamic DSL that allows people to write a lot of build scripts. So here's how I like to think about how it works all together. We have the Gradle API, which is written in Java. And then some people plug in directly into that API through their build scripts. But most of the time, people use the Gradle DSL, which is in Kotlin or Groovy. Um, right now, a lot of people are using the Groovy with a big shift to Kotlin, um, because Kotlin is used by Android and stuff. So it's more and more people are using Kotlin all the time. And then we have a lot of people that write plugins, either in Kotlin, Groovy, or Java, if they're going down to closer to the API level. But on top of all of this, and for the software engineers, are the build scripts. And that is what really matters, because that build script tells you how you're going to interact deep down below with essentially those classes and the jars. Okay, so that's what is Gradle. Now we're gonna go into the structure of the build. So this came up a little bit with Sonotype. We have, like Maven Central, we have a repository. And with that repository, we pull in dependencies into our code. That's all fine and dandy, we understand that. But then, uh, like Eric was, get, Eric was getting to too, we have all those transitive dependencies that get pulled into your code. You make your code, and then you wanna share your code, just like everyone else that made it. So that means you're going to publish your code. Then your code is available in that repository, and the cycle repeats. And so this is why it's important that you have secure code but also use all the secure code. So in our speak, we have dependency management, which is essentially accessing the repositories and pulling in the dependencies and the transitive dependencies. And then we have the tasks, the task which compile, test, and publish your code. Remember, those are the core features. Everything else is kind of an add-on and extra. And then the script is your code, your build configuration, how you want to define things. So, the core concept is we have a build configuration that uses tasks so that we can help manage dependencies. Now, like I said, one of the cool things is we have this build automation tool that is customizable. You could do almost anything you want with it, sometimes too much if you ask some people. And that's because we have this extensive plugin framework. If you go into um, our plugin portal, you'll see tons of plugins that can do a lot of different things. One of the good things is that's a lot of examples. So if you're trying to do something, then you can see how it's done because someone's already done it. Okay, so some of the base plugins. We, of course, have the Java plugins. Now, the two that are most used are the Java library plugin and the application plugin. Uh, most of the time, I use the application plugin because you essentially want that main class configuration. If you have a main, then you're gonna want that application. Now, the application plugin automatically uses that Java plugin. So that means if you're using the Gradle application plugin, you're writing a Java application and you already have the structure for main. So by using this plugin, you have kind of a whole set of configuration that's pre-built for you. And you don't have to define where your main is or anything. It's really nice. And by the way, we also have a Kotlin plugin that does much the same thing, only it's for the Kotlin. And this is really cool because you can have Java programs sitting on side of Kotlin programs, and you could actually build them together. You know, source main Java, source main Kotlin, right there, and they build together. And if you have the, the Kotlin code with the Java, then you just apply Java application and the Kotlin plugin, and it's perfect. Uh, this plugin is, by the way, maintained by Kotlin, not by us. And so you could start to see that the open source community is this really big, rich, vibrant community. All right. Now, the plugins that we have are just one type. Like you saw with the Kotlin, there's a whole bunch of community plugins. And the plugin portal is just widely used. Um, you could publish your own plugins there for other people to kind of download. Um, some of the best ones we'll get to a little bit later, but it's just kind of, 
If you have time, go to the plugin portal and see what's available. It's just amazing. You have plugins to um, help sync with Kafka, with Kubernetes, just everything there that you already want. It's already written probably. And of course, then there's local plugins, which if you're not a build engineer, you probably won't fuss with too much. So these plugins are like the big overarching thing. The plugins, what they do is they provide tasks for you to work on. And a task is kind of the basic concept in Gradle. So you have an input, your code, maybe a different jar, something else. That does an action, and that results to an output. Now, a lot of the outputs are stored in a Gradle directory, something that you'll probably never actually look into, but it's there so that you can be saved for later references. Okay. Here's one example of a task, and this is the test task. And you can imagine that all this is, is inputs. In this case, we have uh, input, which it sets a location inside your directory, and it will output the reports of the test. Now, one of the things that I like about this is here you can see kind of the dependency tree for that test task. And so it uses a whole bunch of other things. We need compile Java and process resources for this one. And so that means those have to be defined before you do this one. And all that is kind of the behind the scenes, what Gradle is doing, so you don't have to worry about making sure your test test has all those other features. Now, when you're writing these tasks, this is something that has kind of changed over the years, um, where we have lazy configuration, it's called. And this took a while for me to get used to, because we want our tasks to be lazy. Lazy means they don't have to use as much resources. And so a lot of the times you might see the task.create, and those are very eager, meaning they gobble up all your resources. Every time you do a build, it essentially runs or essentially makes that task. If you don't want that task made, you're saving resources, and you could use the task.register. So in that case, it's going to define the task without actually creating it, which is really useful. Um, if you're doing a more elaborate test, you might know how to use it, but most of mine are like that. The other thing that I use pretty extensively is the do first and the do last. Now, these are tasks that if you know you want to have something run before another task, then you're going to put in do first, and then you'll see your task graph where it always relies on the do first before the next one. Okay. So, and then, like I said before, the build scans is another one that I use all the time. Each one of my settings.gradle file, I have this blurb because at the end of every run, it generates a URL that has my build scan. Um, so that means if there's a problem, I could take that URL and send it to someone, and they can help me troubleshoot that problem or see how I can manage resources a little bit better. Um, of course, a caveat, this is only recommended for personal projects, um, open source projects, things like that. You don't want to do you know, send your Netflix build or something to it. So all of this so far has been kind of the, the key overarching facts for kind of small projects. Of course, Gradle is very extensible, and so we can change it so it's bigger projects as well. In this case, we have a root project, and off of that root project, there's a whole bunch of sub-projects. Now, this might look familiar, especially to, to Android engineers, because oftentimes you'll have a whole bunch of projects. One of the recommendations for this type of thing is to kind of have a build source folder so that you have a central place to manage your build configuration. And I think I have that next, yeah. So in this example, we have a build.gradle.kts, that's our Kotlin version, and each one of the sub-projects has a build file. So in this case, we have the app in the model, and each one has different dependencies, a different configuration, and a different management. Now, the problem with this is that it can get very hard to keep track of the configuration of all of these projects. And then if you're taking your project and you're publishing it, then somebody else is going to take your project, and they have no clue how you manage your project. So this is not necessarily always the recommended method. The way that we recommend now is to use what's called a build source folder, build SRC. And this is really good for kind of a central location for all of your build logic. And so you can have your build logic in one spot and then apply it to the other projects. 
And in this one, you can see that it's called Shared Build Conventions. I like that name because then you know that it's a shared convention between the projects. So some tips that they don't tell you that is kind of useful if you run the thing. Uh, if you're running the Gradle wrapper, uh, dash dash console equals plain, or dash dash console equals ver verbose, those are really useful if you're trying to kind of troubleshoot your build. Um, I use the verbose almost most of the time. It spits out a lot of, lot of stuff, but oftentimes you can scroll through. Uh, you could pipe that to a file and then read it later. Both of those are really nice. So let's zoom out on the structure of a build. So we have two different types of people that generally use it. We have the build user, which is going to be your software developer, and then we have the build author, which is oftentimes the build tool engineer. Sometimes it's the, the software engineer that has to kind of delve into the build. So the build user, they're going to be launching the tasks. For example, debug, test, assembly, and so forth. They don't need to know a whole bunch of the build structure. They just need to know which task to run. And so those are the ones that you're going to send your project, and you say, just run this, and you'll get everything working. And that's because behind the scenes, there was a build author that made the build logic that is essentially what Gradle uses to run. Now, a third party is those plugin authors. And so all of that is essentially taken into one central location, which is your Gradle project. Now, all of this is stored in a folder. That's why I have a lovely folder here, because all of the Gradle logic, you have your build model, which essentially delves into that DSL. You have your task graph, which goes into the execution project. And so as a build user, all you really care about are what tasks to run. Okay. You can spend more time on this, but I want to move on since we have a lot of performance stuff. So now it's kind of getting into the, the details of what software engineers probably want to know. First one is Java tool change. So we saw last time that it's really important to upgrade to the most recent version of Java. That is really important. But sadly, not all projects are capable of running the newest version of Java all the time. And so you might have some sub-projects that use an old version of Java and this other one that uses a newer one. And that's OK. You might be used to having all those problems with your Java home. And that was a common pain point with developers. And so we went ahead and delved away to kind of fix the Java issue. Now, you might have heard of you know, different infrastructure provisioning tools like Puppet. Has anyone used Puppet? A few of you have? OK. I never actually used Puppet. So. Um, and there's, of course, virtual images. And if you use these tools, you can make sure that you have the correct version of Java available for the user. Just because it's the correct version of Java is available doesn't mean it's the right version that is used, though. Um, and so what we have is we have something called tool chains. And what tool chains do is it makes sure the correct version of Java is used for each project or sub-project. And so here's a little bit of the code, and you can see it's pretty easy. This one is set to, anyone want to guess what version of Java this one's using? I see mouthing 11, so that's perfect. Um, and of course, like everything, you can turn this on and off with a, um, a tool change flag. So where this becomes really useful is you can start to specify which tasks will use which versions of Java. Um, here we can see that we have Java compile is set to 17, and then we have an extra kind of project in there, and the run extra is set to version 18. And so if, if you give this to that build user, then depending on which task they run, they're actually going to use a different version of Java. And so hopefully the goal with this is when you give it to the user, you no longer get that complaint of, why do I have some... Java home error or something, because they're going to be using the right version. OK. Now, another big one is testing. I think everyone has seen the, the testing pyramid. Um, and Justin talked a lot about how testing is really slow, and people want to speed it up and whatnot. Well, end-to-end -end testing is always going to be slow. We don't really want to do that too often, because it's so slow. 
But unit tests and integration tests are something that we frequently, frequently run all the time. And those integration tests, especially, they run really slow. And so, I've skipped a few before. I know I need to run this, because they're so slow. Now, one of the things that we do is we split the tests so you can run your integration tests more at a more cadence than your, or your unit tests at a frequent cadence than your integration tests. So of course we have a task to run all tests, but if you split it out, then you could run the unit test and the integration test separately, and you can choose your cadence then. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. Well, first, um, some of you are probably used to splitting out the unit test and the integration test. The way that this has been done before is you create a source set. These are the sources for your unit test. These are your sources for your integration test. You configure the dependencies for both. The integration test often had many more. You set the class paths and then you create a custom task for each one so that each task was different. When you ran the unit test, only the unit test were in, integration test, only unit. So now we have something called the JVM test suites. And this is really cool because when you use the test suites, all of this other stuff with your configuring class paths is kind of done behind the scenes automatically. So first we, of course, apply the plugin in our build file, and then we start to program how we want the test to actually work. And so what this one does is it makes an integrated integration test folder, which is essentially a different part of the unit test. So you can run integration tests separately. Um, and this is a very basic example. There's a whole bunch more in the test suites documentation. Um, so another big part of testing is test coverage. Um, with TDD, I've heard that it's a five tests per line of code is one of the recommendations, which that seemed a little high. Anyone have a better number than five? No? Um, I've never had five tests per line of code personally, but I guess some people do. So we have the Jococo plugin, which is really nice because it will tell you how many lines of code are actually tested. And it will fail your build based on that number of lines. And so in this case, we are, of course, applying the Jococo plugin, and then we have the Jococo test coverage verification task. And what this task does is it essentially looks at it and counts how many, code, how many lines of code are covered, and if it's not 90% of lines coverage, then it's going to fail that build with this task. That's kind of cool. So now if you have a software developer that's adding code to your project, and you send this to them, and you have them run this, their build will fail if they don't have enough tests for their thing. So some other ones that people really like is for code styling. Uh, for code styling, there's the Java check style. It's a really highly used one. Um, for Groovy Code Narc, for Kotlin Detect, and this essentially checks your code style and helps apply the right rules for the language. Um, and then, of course, we still have a Scala one, which I haven't met more than like five users that are interested in our Scala, so I'm not sure why I included it there, but it's there. Okay, so now dependencies. So we recently launched Gradle 7, and with that we have version catalogs. This is a really new feature, but it's one that kind of is amazing for dependency resolution. Um, a little bit against the, the normal Gradle policy is that this is a TOML file, and the TOML file has four sections where we have the versions, the libraries, how you want to bundle together, and then the plugins that you might use. So what does this look like? So here you can see we're defining the Groovy version. We're defining the check style we want for our code. Excuse me. We have the different libraries that we're using. And notice on this bottom line that we're actually applying the different versions that we want with some weird language down here. Then we bundle up our Groovy ones together, so all of the Groovy, we can just use it with just one Groovy. And then we're using some plugins. So when we're using that version catalog, we can use what is defined in that version catalog, much like any other dependency, where we have libs. and here groovy.core. And so I'm setting that as an implementation dependency. 
And then, of course, I do the same for the other ones. I could have shortcut it. But I wanted to talk about how these are an implementation dependency. One of the common problems that I've seen is people use an API rather than an implementation dependency. Now, there's a big difference, of course, between the API and the implementation. Um, and that depends on whether you want the essentially dependencies to be available for others later on down your project. Um, so when you're making these, you've got to think about whether it's an internal implementation dependency or if it's an API and you want it available for others later on. Now, everything in green here is essentially the different configurations that are available at this point in time. And so you can have it so that it's a runtime-only dependency or a compile-only dependency. And you want to think about the scope that you have for the dependencies. And then, of course, these are the ones that are commonly used. So when it comes to the version, this is a huge thing because you know, we just heard the, the last two talks about how you should use the version that makes sense for security. You should upgrade. You make, want to make sure that you don't upgrade to you know, something that's not secure. And that is true when you're defining your build logic as well. And there's a lot of ways to kind of manage your dependencies. In this top one, this is using version 2.3 or later. So if there's a 2.4, 2.5, that is later, so it'll use that version. If you have two exclamation marks, then that is strictly. That's the one that I like to use a lot because it allows for a reproducible build. I know exactly what I'm getting. I know what's going out. So I use that strictly most of the time. And then, of course, snapshots, which I rarely use. Um, if you want to see more about kind of the version, then there's a link there for that, too. But then we also have the, the bracket and the parentheses, which allows you to do kind of the bounds of the versions. And people like that a lot. But I like the strictly the best. And as far as security, that's a good call, too. Uh, so one of the problems with versions, of course, is, like I said, they can change. And so if you take your project and you want to share it to somebody else, and you're using something that's like 2 point plus, it might work on your computer at that time. But then tomorrow, you send it to your user, and suddenly, it's now 2.7, 2.8. Well, maybe one of the things you used somehow broke. Now, the build won't be producible, and it will fail for your user. And so I like that strictly. Now, the other thing that this is really useful for is whenever you're using a build cache, the versions are cached for a certain amount of time. And so if you're using version 2.6, it's not going to necessarily pull that 2.7 for your build right then. So if you send your build somewhere else, maybe they're using 2.7, but you might still be using 2.6 because it's cached. Um, so some of the common pitfalls that I've seen. The other thing that Gradle does, and this is another behind the scenes thing, is here we have a dependency on Guava, 30.11. We also have a dependency on Juice, 5.10. So Juice also has a Guava dependency. For 5.1.0, according to the dependency graph here, we know that the dependency is on Guava 30.1. Well, since we defined the dependency 30.11, it's going to automatically override that Juice dependency and use the 30.11 everywhere. Uh, only one version allowed of each dependency. I like that, but everyone does. Okay, so these are version catalogs. And the thing that I really love about them is you can have all of your dependencies in one spot and then use them for your other projects. And so in this, we can see that it's just you're using the library or the version catalog from a different project. And so if you're starting to have a project and you, wanna, you have a trusted set of you know, dependencies you want to import, then you can pull in that version catalog in one spot. Okay. Running through this fast, because I know lunch is you know, in like five minutes or something. So performance. Um, Gradle automatically has, like I said, a lot of those features that have come with time. Kind of like a assistive lane driving in cars. We have, um, we have compilation avoidance, but then we also have incremental builds. So whenever you're running our project, you'll see a lot of up-to-dates. That's normal and OK. It means it pulled it from something that happened really recently. Everyone's using this already. Some of the things that aren't being used, though, is the build cache. It is amazing to me how many people haven't turned it on. And yes, this is from Justin's talk, um, although the data here is different. 
This is data from Spring Boot. And here they had a build that took 20.25 minutes, and that was just how long it took to build. And then when they used just build cache, it dropped to 3.22. It's a pretty big drop. And this is just with, you know, using build cache. So what is build cache? Oftentimes when I'm developing, I will make these changes. Oh, does that work? Build. No, that didn't work. What about this? No, that didn't work. Then I go back to the drawing board. What about this? Okay, I'm back to where I was. And so each one of those builds is essentially stored on your local build. And so if I go back to the beginning, then the build is gonna be instantaneous because that already happened. And so every single build is stored locally and it essentially pulls from it. Okay. Now to turn on build cache, you can have a, via the command line, dash dash build cache, or what I do is I put it in the Gradle properties folder. And this isn't done by default, so you have to add it to your build, but it makes it so that your build pulls from all the other stuff. And so if you know you have uh, system.printout hello world, and you add other stuff to it, and then you go back to hello world, the hello world will actually be pulled from the build cache because you ran it before. Okay. So another feature that I absolutely love is the configuration cache. Um, now this is not yet stable. Sorry, so it's one of those in the works. Um, but we are seeing great improvements with it. And what this does is it caches the entire configuration lifecycle. Now there's essentially three phases of a Gradle lifecycle. There's initialization, configuration, and execution. Most of the time, software developers don't care about configuration, right? And most of the time, configuration doesn't change. If you're changing your code, the configuration of the build won't change. And so configuration cache means you can use that entire build cache before. Um, so in order to use this, you have to change your settings.gradle file to enable this, and then also the Gradle properties, you have to add it in too. But the savings of the configuration cache are huge. Uh, this is uh, Tony from Square, he tweeted this the other day, that at Square they're saving 5,400 hours a year by just turning on the build cache. That's huge, right? Um, I think that's like three years of engineering time or something ridiculous. Uh, we just finished a, a hackathon with configuration cache. We're trying to make it stable, but it's a really big process, so it's not there yet. Here's another example of kind of how the configuration cache has, has helped with some people. Just running the help task drops it. This is the assemble task. So you can see configuration cache is really helpful with time. Another one that isn't used very often that I highly recommend that you turn on is the continuous build. Now, and this is such a, a fundamental change that I actually go into my IntelliJ and change it so that this is on my most used task, dash dash continuous. Because when you're in your program and you're changing you know, your class, your method, whatnot, it actually senses the file has changed and it will run that task behind the scenes. And so if you have like an Android app, for example, up, and you have the continuous enabled, it's like you've ran that task again behind the scenes. And so you don't have to essentially worry with your build, it's kind of automatically there. Uh, another one is parallel. Uh, by default, most of the tests are run synchronously, one after another, and you have to actually opt into parallel. Uh, this is because if you have multiple projects, parallel isn't very smart, and the input, if it's using the, the output of one, if it's using the input to the other, then you might get a build failure. And so this is another opt-in one. Now, finally, this is the last one, and this is for probably, the, the build engineers have probably seen this one before, I'm guessing. And this is the profiler. Um, I like to use the profiler when I'm at the final stages of my kind of program, and I wanna see what takes a long time to run and why. And so you essentially, this is an entire separate thing, but you have a performance scenario and you're running it essentially like, do I want this version of Java or this version of Java? Um, I did this recently with, um, I think some Maven builds, where I ran Maven on something and Gradle on something, it was kind of seeing the, the benchmarks for it. But it really lets you have the insights for your build. Because the profiler lets you see how long the builds take to run. And it does essentially a clean build again and again and again and again. And so this is 
after like 20 iterations. And the output of that is a flame graph, or a flame chart or a graph. Now this flame chart, this one is interactive, done a little while ago, but if you click on it, you can actually zoom in to each one of these to see how one version compares to the other and where you can have that potential speed up. So those are pretty nice. Okay, one minute over, so not bad. We went over all of these things. Uh, you can reach me on various social media platforms. Uh, we're on gradle.com and gradle.org. And this talk is on that tiny URL if you need it. Any questions? Except for from the build engineers. I'm not taking questions from them. <laughs> um, what is the easiest way to get Gradle to give you information? So one of my biggest problems about this Gradle is how you plug it. And depending on how the plugin is written, the configuration for it is just vastly different from a syntax. Where it's made in everything for sex and now. Yeah. How is there a good way to be able to like, figure out if something is supposed to be assigned a, a map, a list, a mm -hmm. Um, so the, the question is essentially with all the pl plugins out there, how can you know how to interact with that plugin so that it's a something you're expecting essentially? Because in Maven it's a very uniform way of doing it. And with our plugins, it's all over the place. Does that frame it up good? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so this is actually a really common pain point with our community. And we have a plugin portal that has all these plugins, and some plugins are way better than other plugins. And so some of the things that we're looking at is having like a, a test suite for plugin authors. So here's the test that they have to run so that they can get like a badge on their thing. Maven Central does such a good job at how they handle that, where you can see downloads and all the other statistics. And down the road, we're hoping to have that type of thing too, so you can see how many people are using certain plugins. And most of the time, if it's a highly used plugin, then it's probably something that's easier to work with than one of those that's not there. That's still in development, though. <laughs> we only have about 20 developers, so things take time. Good question. Any others? Everyone just wants to eat, right? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, no question. So with Spring Brute and Gradle, the versions? So if I got that right, uh, Spring Boot and Gradle, why do the versions not line up all the way? And that was the first big one, right? Um, so it's actually funny because if you look at our download numbers, Spring Boot is one of the biggest ones that is being used all the time as far as plugins go. Uh, it's really, really huge. And right now we're on Gradle version 751, actually. And I'm not sure which one Spring Boot is using right now. But being compatible with Spring Boot is one of the things that's like the, one of the top priorities for us. And so if you have some examples, then point them to me. And I will bother our devs to make sure that they are compatible. <laughs> Yeah. So essentially, when you're using an older version of Spring Boot, there's an issue. Um, and if that's the case, then I know that in Android, that's where I do a lot of my time, there's a compatibility chart with if you're using this version of Android, you've got to use this version of Gradle, and so forth. I don't know if there's something like that with Spring Boot, but maybe there should be. Or if you're using this version of Spring Boot, we recommend this version of Gradle. That would be a good idea to have. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so he's pointing out that the, the syntactic changes is going to like five to seven in Gradle. 
And that's one of the, the big things is a lot of times when we make those changes and the big changes, we're gonna get a lot of breaking changes. And a lot of time and effort goes into kind of making sure that your project is good from seven to eight and so forth. It takes a lot of developer time, it really does. So, um, but we do have some migration guides. If, if you look at the release, you'll see that there's a migration guide for all of them. That, did I spend too long writing? <laughs> okay, uh -huh. Um, so when we're doing scopes, we have essentially the API scope or the implementation scope and things like that. And so the compile only and the runtime scope. Um, but it's, it's time, so let's talk at lunch, okay? Okay, thank you guys. <laughs>